Although you probably won't hear it from an adherent of Eastern Orthodoxy, there is strong patristic support for the Filioque. Many quotes supporting the Filioque can be given from the Latin and Western Fathers. But many people don't seem to realize that the Filioque also finds great support in statements made by Greek and Eastern Fathers. For instance, St. Athanasius, a Greek father, repeatedly teaches that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Son, and he makes other statements that are quite relevant to our topic. In his third discourse against the Arians, St. Athanasius says, quote, For he, the Son, as has been said, gives to the Spirit, and whatever the Spirit has, he has from the Word, end quote. Since whatever the Spirit has, he has from the Word, that means that the Holy Spirit has his hypostatic origin and the divine nature from the Son, as he has it from the Father. Such a text clearly supports the Filioque. The next passage from St. Athanasius concerns a text in John 16, an extremely important passage. Therefore, we must consider it, for it constitutes more powerful proof for the Filioque. As recorded in John 16, 13 to 15, Jesus declares, quote, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will receive what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will receive what is mine and declare it to you, end quote. Here we read that the Holy Spirit will receive or take what is the Son's and declare it. If the Holy Spirit receives or takes from the Son, that implies a source or a principle. It indicates that the Son, together with the Father, is the eternal principle or source of the Holy Spirit, and therefore that the Holy Spirit has his hypostatic origin and the divine nature from the Son, as well as from the Father. This proves the Filioque. To further recognize why this is the case, think of it this way. We know that the Holy Spirit has his hypostatic origin and the divine nature from the Father through eternal procession. Well, through that eternal procession, the Holy Spirit lacks nothing of what he has. He lacks nothing of the divine nature. He lacks no knowledge of the future, etc. Thus, if the Holy Spirit also receives or takes from the Son in regard to declaring the future, that could only be if he has his hypostatic origin and the divine nature from the Son, as well as from the Father. In this regard, some might ask, if this passage refers to the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit from the Son, why does it use the future tense and declare that the Holy Spirit will receive or will take from the Son? The answer, as St. Thomas Aquinas points out, is that, quote, the Holy Spirit receives eternally, and the verbs of any tense can be applied to the eternal because eternity embraces the whole of time, end quote. The very fact that Scripture describes the Holy Spirit as receiving in this way from the Son demonstrates that it's referring to eternal procession from the Son. But the future tense is fitting because a verb of the future tense can be applied to the eternal, and the Holy Spirit would be declaring things to the apostles in the future. Also consider this, only the Son of God became man. The Father and the Holy Spirit did not become man. So how does a divine person, the Holy Spirit, who is not incarnate, receive or take from another divine person in terms of declaring the future? It could only be through eternal procession. Hence, the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds from the Son as well as from the Father. In fact, when Jesus repeats his statement that the Holy Spirit will receive what is his, he connects it with the truth that all that the Father has is mine. Since the Son has all of what the Father has, and the Father spirates the Holy Spirit, the Son also spirates the Holy Spirit. Also notice that John 16.13 says that the Holy Spirit will speak, quote, whatever he hears. This is in reference to what the Holy Spirit hears from the Son. This is basically parallel to what Jesus says about himself in regard to the Father. John 5.30, quote, I can do nothing from myself, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, end quote. John 5.19-20, quote, Amen, amen, I say to you, the Son can do nothing from himself, but only what he sees the Father doing, for whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing, end quote. When Christ says that he can do nothing from himself, but only what he sees the Father doing, he is not saying that he is powerless, but rather that he has the divine nature from the Father and is one with him in the divinity. He was responding to the Jews who sought to kill him because he had said that God is his Father, and therefore that he is equal to God. So when Jesus says that he can do nothing from himself, he is indicating that he is not a renegade God, seeking divine worship contrary to the Father, but rather is one God with him, and what he has, he has from him. 
Thus, Jesus says in John 5, 26, quote, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has given it to the Son also to have life in himself, end quote. On the matter of the Father's showing and the Son's hearing in John 5, St. Thomas Aquinas comments, quote, The Father's showing and the Son's hearing are to be taken in the sense that the Father communicates knowledge to the Son as he communicates his essence, end quote. The hearing from the Father indicates that the divine essence is communicated to the Son from the Father. Well, as we just read, the Holy Spirit also hears from the Son. Quote, Whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will receive what is mine and declare it to you. End quote. So, as Christ hears from the Father because the divine nature is communicated to the Son from the Father, the Holy Spirit hears from the Son because the divine nature is communicated to the Holy Spirit through eternal procession from the Son, as well as from the Father. Also, notice again that Jesus says, quote, Whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Since the Father spirates the Holy Spirit, the Son does likewise. Now, in his first epistle to Serapion, commenting on John 16, St. Athanasius states, quote, The Spirit in turn receives from the Son. He will take from what is mine, he says, and declare it to you, John 16, 14. Therefore, since the Spirit has the same relation of nature and order with respect to the Son that the Son has with respect to the Father, how can the one who calls the Spirit a creature escape the necessity of thinking the same about the Son, end quote. If the Spirit has the same relation of nature with respect to the Son that the Son has to the Father, that can only be if the Holy Spirit has his hypostatic origin and the divine nature from the Son, because the Son has it from the Father. Thus, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son as well as from the Father. Such a text clearly supports the Filioque. We could cover more from St. Athanasius, but it was passages like these from the Fathers, many of which were presented during the debates at the Reunion Council of Florence, that convinced Bessarion of Nicaea and Isidore of Kiev, who had been separated from the Catholic Church, to accept the Filioque. Concerning the passages from the Fathers that support the Filioque, Bessarion wrote, quote, It was not the syllogisms or the force of arguments that lead me to believe this, that is, the Latin position on the Filioque, but the plain words of the doctors. For when I saw and heard them, straightway I put aside all contention and controversy and yielded to the authority of those whose words they were. For I judged that the Holy Fathers, speaking as they did in the Holy Spirit, could not have departed from the truth, and I was grieved that I had not heard their words before. End quote. 